Uh, so I want to thank Helen for inviting me to come and talk to you about what I've learned about nuclear weapons scientists by spending much of my career studying them. As you heard, I'm an anthropologist. Anthropologists try and make sense of people who are often radically different than we are. Uh, my graduate student advisor studied ritual headhunters in the Philippines, and I decided to try and go him one better. With the weapon scientists. Um, So in 1987, I arrived at Livermore, a town about an hour east of San Francisco, home of the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and this is the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, to try and understand uh, the nuclear weapon scientists uh, who live there. And since that time, I've also spent a fair amount of time at this facility, the Los Alamos National Lab, which designed the original atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. Um, two books have come out of that work that I did, uh, People of the Bomb, and the first book, Nuclear Rights, is specifically about the scientists at Livermore, and asked the question, how does one come to feel that one has a vocation to work on weapons of mass destruction? What kinds of people would want to devote their lives to working on uh, a nuclear weapons lab? And one of the things I found when I arrived at Livermore was that and I should say, by the way, that I came as someone who worked on the staff of the nuclear freeze campaign. So I came from a background myself of anti-nuclear activism. I found that the weapons scientists had misconceptions about anti-nuclear activists, and anti-nuclear activists had misconceptions about weapons scientists. So to start with the weapons scientists' misconceptions about the community most of you belong to, I found it was very common that they believed that anti-nuclear activists were unemployed, Otherwise, how would they have the time to come and protest at the lab? And they were quite convinced that many, if not most, anti-nuclear activists were communists, and that the movement in the 1980s was partly funded by the Soviet Union. So that was the misconceptions that, that they had about anti-nuclear activists. I found um, that anti-nuclear activists uh, strongly believed, in many cases, that nuclear weapon scientists were right-wing, that this was a right-wing vocation, and they believed that weapon scientists did not think about the ethics of their vocation because if they spend any time thinking about it, how could they possibly do it? Uh, I found something more interesting and more complicated. Um, many of the weapon scientists I spoke to were liberals. They were active in the civil rights movement. Some of them have been arrested in the civil rights movement. Uh, they were active in the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, gun control, interestingly enough. Many of them gave to the Sierra Club and other environmental groups. And in fact, from my own straw poll, if the 1988 presidential election had been um, campaigned solely at the Little Mall Lab, then we would have had President Dukakis. So many of them are liberals. It's not political ideology, uh, conservative political ideology, that makes people into weapon scientists. About two thirds of them were mainline Christians, and the largest group of them were Catholics, but also lots of Presbyterians, Episcopalians, uh, Methodists, uh, and so on. A disproportionate number of them were women. By that I mean a disproportionately high number. Uh, you don't find many women in physics, so it wasn't a large number in absolute terms, but you did have disproportionately more women working as weapon scientists than you would find in the rest of the physics. <clears throat> um, they did not originally become weapons designers for ideological reasons. They took the job for the same reason many of us take jobs, that there's something about the workplace that appeals to us. Greg Mallow in his talk talked about the salaries that uh, weapon scientists make, and the salaries are generous. Uh, what I found is that although obviously salary played a reason, uh, it wasn't the main reason why people became weapon scientists. They were drawn to a place where there was an ethos of teamwork, and where they didn't have to write lots of grant proposals. Uh, they had resources just readily made available to them, including some of the best supercomputers and experimental facilities in the world. And there's an interesting kind of paradox here. I did go and interview physics professors whose students had gone to the labs. And the physics professors told me that their really mean, nasty, vicious students all became professors, like me. <laughs> <laughs> and that, strangely enough, uh, the way one Harvard physics professor put it, it was his kind of gentle students who went to Livermore and Los Alamos because they didn't have to be constantly elbowing other people out of the way for resources, and they were drawn to this sort of practice of teamwork. 
So they're drawn by lab resources and teamwork, but when they get to the lab, they learn what I call the central axiom. Well, this is where the ethical component comes in. They learn to believe that nuclear weapons kept the peace during the Cold War, that nuclear weapons make uh, major warfare between major powers, superpowers, uh, unthinkable, if not impossible. So a number of weapons scientists, when I asked them about the ethics of their work, told me that they felt proud, that they believed they'd saved millions of lives uh, by preventing World War III. And you may find this very strange, but I found some weapons scientists who told me that they would not work on any weapons but nuclear weapons, because it would be unethical. So they told me they would not work on napalm, they would not work on a conventional cruise missile, because those weapons are made to kill people. And they believed that they were working on weapons uh, whose only job was to deter. Well, I don't want to give you the impression that the culture of the scientists is sort of completely unchanging through time. So let me talk to you about three errors in the political and ethical culture of nuclear weapon scientists. And there'll be major shifts, I think, in the collective culture of the community. The first I call the era of initiation from 1945 when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to the mid to late 1960s. Then the era of normalization in the late uh, 1960s until 1991. Uh, and then what I call the era of simulation, which began in 1992 and went until uh, goes until the present time. So in terms of that first era, the era of initiation, uh, this is when the major design breakthroughs were made. It was when the atomic bomb itself was designed, the major breakthrough, and when uh, scientists figured out in the early 1950s how to make a hydrogen bomb. Then uh, later on in the 1950s, they figured out how to miniaturize a warhead so that you could put several warheads on intercontinental missiles. So all of the major breakthroughs in nuclear weapons design are made by the end of the 1950s, basically. Um, this was the era of above-ground nuclear tests. We've heard from Holly Barker about the big hydrogen bombs tests done in the Pacific, but there were also lots of smaller atomic bomb tests done in the Nevada nuclear test site. So the scientists had a direct, embodied, visceral experience of the weapons they designed. And I've collected a lot of narratives of above-ground nuclear tests from the older scientists, where they describe what it's like to watch one of these weapons go off. And in this period, um, there was a palpable, real, felt risk of nuclear war. The Americans and the Soviets had not yet sort of figured out the rules of the road in their relationship. There were a number of threats, the Berlin crises, the Korean crisis, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, some of the older nuclear weapons scientists did feel that there was a possibility that nuclear weapons could be used. And a number of the older weapons scientists had built shelters in their uh, backyards. You know, one person I interviewed had gone in with several other families and they built a shelter together. And they had these very arcane debates about whether they would shoot people who tried to get into their shelter who hadn't picked dues. Uh, on weekends, once a year, they and the other families would practice for the war and go down in the shelters and so on. But this was followed by the era of normalization the mid-60s to 1991, and it's towards the end of this era that I arrived to get to know nuclear weapon scientists. Uh, the design breakthroughs are over, and it's just a sort of routinization of, of design, figuring out how to get a slightly larger explosion out of a little less plutonium, how to shrink the warhead, make it a little uh, smaller, maybe how to make it safer with a different kind of high explosive and so on. Uh, one of the physics professors I interviewed described the kind of work being done by the weapons labs in this era as, and I quote, polishing turds. Um, because it was, you know, just sort of perfecting a little bit something that was already basically done. Um, no more above ground tests. This is the era after uh, 1963 of underground nuclear tests. And by the way, I do want to say something about 1963 in terms of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Remember the older scientists vividly remember JFK coming to visit Livermore very shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he's the only US president who ever asked to see a nuclear weapon. Um, so he came to Livermore and he insisted that they show him one of these weapons. He wanted to see what it was that he'd come so close to using. Um, but from the 1960s onwards, uh, the tests uh, uh, detonated underground. 
so they become somewhat more abstract. I mean, weapon scientists maybe feel the earth shake a little bit, they see the needles flicker on the oscilloscopes. The bombs are still being exploded, but it's contained underground. And meanwhile, the relationship with the Soviets is increasingly normalized through this web of arms control treaties, starting with a limited test ban treaty, a non-proliferation treaty, then a partial test ban treaty that restricts the size of the tests, sort one, sort two, and so on. So scientists who come and work at the lab in this era have the feeling that the competition with the Soviets is contained, it's normalized, there are rules of the road, and that they're part of a game, if you like. It's sort of a symbolic competition in which their nuclear tests are sort of tokens. Then, <clears throat> in 1992, Bush the Elder uh, declares a moratorium on nuclear testing. President Clinton decides not to resume nuclear testing. So the US's last nuclear test was in uh, 1992. Um, and they become replaced with simulations. These are Senators Exxon, Hatfield, and Mitchell, two Democrats, one Republican. These are the Senators who write the legislation in 1982 that declares that moratorium on nuclear testing uh, and finally ends nuclear testing. The main mover, actually, was James Exxon, a relatively conservative Democrat, and it was a visit to the Nevada test site where he saw the crater left behind by a peaceful nuclear explosion, that gave him what his aide described to me as a new religious experience, and made him come back to Washington and decide that they had to end nuclear testing once and for all, having seen that crater. The labs fought really hard to keep nuclear tests. And you have to understand something about the central role of nuclear testing in the experimental practice of the labs and the organizational culture. First of all, the labs believed that they could not design new nuclear weapons without testing them. You, know, you design something that's fundamentally new, the only way you can be sure it will go off is to plug it underground and press the button and see what happens. But, uh, but tests mattered for more reasons than that. The way the older scientists apprenticed younger scientists was by giving them design tasks, by subcontracting, part of the preparation for nuclear tests. And then as they became more experienced, giving them progressively greater and greater responsibilities until they had responsibility for an entire nuclear test. That was how you grew a new experienced weapon scientist who had the judgment, the intuition for the bomb, to know when a bomb would be reliable. And so without nuclear testing, they would not have their principal means of socializing and apprenticing new nuclear uh, designers. Finally, the main thing the lab did is it did nuclear tests. Nuclear tests were their main products. And so Exxon, Hatfield, and Mitchell took that away from them. There was a meeting in uh, March of 1993 between Hayes Lowe the Secretary of Energy, the three lab directors, several other smaller bed players were present at this meeting. I didn't see 10 people who were at this meeting. This is the meeting where it was finally decided that the Clinton administration would not allow them to do any more tests that they would have to learn to live in a world without nuclear tests. And one of those three guys, and I know actually in the anti-nuclear movement, Hazel O'Leary is seen as the, but this was a major achievement. And I've interviewed a lot of people around that. And you do not know what she went through to beat back the lab directors, to beat back the opposition from that, um, and to get the Secretary of Defense to finally agree to it, to get the National Security Advisor to finally agree to this. Without that woman, we would not have a test ban treaty. As far as I'm concerned, she is the main author of the test ban treaty. One of those people. Her name. Hazel O'Leary. And one of those three lab directors, and I'm not allowed to tell you which one, towards the end of the meeting, when it's clear the meeting is not going the way the lab directors wanted it to, one of the lab directors said, if you gave us as much money not to test nuclear weapons as you gave us to test them, I'm sure the labs could find a way of continuing to assure the reliability of the weapons. <laughs> and so, thus was born a program called Science-Based Stockpile Stewardship, where the labs were given very expensive devices on which they could simulate aspects of nuclear tests. This is one of those devices, the Lawrence Livermore Lab, the National Ignition Facility cost four and a half billion dollars. It's a few blocks away from the suburban housing estate, 
Astonishingly, they create temperatures and pressures greater than those inside the sun with this laser. They create uh, the inside of a hydrogen bomb, even as simply there. This is a facility in Los Alamos uh, in which you can implode atomic bombs that have had the plutonium removed and the stimulant put inside to see if the compression of the warhead seems to be working properly. And these are the uh, supercomputers that are used uh, at the labs to integrate a lot of that um, data into three-dimensional simulations. And I want to emphasize that lab scientists do not believe that they can design new weapons with these fundamentally new weapons. It's about apprenticing new designers. They use the simulations to train new designers and trying to figure out something about the reliability of the old weapons. So here are simulations. Let's go back to this. Uh, test the band, replace the simulations, a grand bargain, stockpile stewardship. The weapons designs are broadly frozen. Every year, the number of nuclear weapons designers with actual nuclear test experience shrinks. I cannot get labs to tell me exactly how many living weapons designers have experienced the nuclear test, but I believe the number is somewhere between 10 and 20. If we come back and have this meeting in 10 years' time, it may be in the single digits. And there's a real aporia between people who've actually tested a nuclear weapon and people who've been trained with simulations. But the weapons have become still more abstract. This is a facility at Los Alamos called the Cave. You can stand inside a simulation of an exploding hydrogen bomb. Those people are actually inside an H-bomb as it explodes in a simulated sense. And they have these magic wands where they can stop and rewind aspects of it that can amplify things and so on. This is the aesthetic relationship to an exploding nuclear weapon now, which is very different from the aesthetic relationship that that first generation of nuclear weapon scientists had. Um, and in this period, the weapons are increasingly sort of about themselves. You have the weapons because the weapons exist. And they must be deterred because the weapons exist. You can't put them back in the, in the bottle. There's not this sense of an urgent Cold War arms race with the Russians. And in the situation, the anxiety that the weapon scientists have is actually anxiety about the aging of the weapons. So if you talk to the weapon scientists and you ask them what's on their mind, what's on their mind is that as the plutonium degrades and gets older, they can't be sure that the weapons are as reliable as they used to be. And will these simulations and these computer programs really work so that they can understand at what point the weapon no longer becomes reliable? Okay, thank you. They also have a lot of anxiety about proliferation, and I'll get to that in a second. So let me give you my concluding thoughts. First of all, about weapons reliability. Eventually, I don't know when, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, there will be major questions about the reliability of American nuclear weapons if the weapons have not been abolished at that point. But if we assume that the stockpile sticks around, there will come a point where there are questions about the reliability and no one with nuclear test experience will be around to answer those questions. This may sound strange to you, but the ethical issue that young nuclear weapon scientists worry about is this. If they believe that they've lost confidence in the reliability of the nuclear weapon, should they go to the lab director and share that loss of confidence? If the lab director won't listen to them, should they go to Congress? Should they go to the media? They believe that it is their overriding job to guarantee the reliability of the weapons, which ultimately guarantees the safety of the United States. They also believe that no lab director will ever want to hear that the scientists have lost confidence in the reliability of the weapons, because that raises the specter of needing to ask for nuclear testing back again. And I have not met a nuclear weapons scientist who believes it is politically feasible to bring nuclear testing back. And they know that people in Washington, in the White House, and the lab director do not want to hear from them that they've lost confidence in the reliability of the weapons. So that's a major issue. Uh, that they worry about. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, what are the weapons for, and who should have them? You know, the weapons, as I said, are tautological. They've sort of become about themselves. It's not that we're focused on an adversary as we were in the Cold War. 
we have to have the weapons because the weapons exist and the weapons must be deterred. But the thing they really worry about is black and brown people getting nuclear weapons. They really worry about nuclear proliferation. And I know that uh, all of you in this room do as well. So at the risk of making myself unpopular, uh, I'll share with you that I have written an article in which I've argued that it is fundamentally racist to believe that nuclear weapons would be any less safe in the hands of Iranians, or Arabs, or Africans, or North Koreans, than in the hands of Europeans and Americans. But this is one of the dominant structuring ideologies of our age, I think, to believe that there are people from certain countries of a certain skin color who could be trusted with the weapons, and there are people of other religions and other skin colors from other countries who cannot be trusted with the weapons, that they're sort of children. Um, my third concluding thought, I showed you that image of the designers inside the exploding bomb. I worry that the weapons are becoming more and more abstract. That's why what Alex is doing is really important to remind us what the weapons can do. A former director of Los Alamos, Harold Agnew, used to say that every five years they should take a weapon out, detonate it on an island uh, in front of all the leaders of countries of the world to remind them what these weapons can do. Uh, we're not getting uh, too far from the age when there will be no one alive who has seen a nuclear explosion. And then finally, a thought on abolition, and I guess this is a cautionary thought to you. You might be surprised to know that there are a number of nuclear weapon scientists who are in favor of abolishing nuclear weapons, especially older ones who are nearing retirement. And it's not out of a moral concern about the weapons. They say in an era, in a world, where the US has uncontested conventional military domination, a world without nuclear weapons would be one where no country was safe from the United States. The United States could militarily enforce its will anywhere it wanted to. And so you should be aware that there is a different narrative of nuclear abolition out there. Thank you.